Thank you all for joining us today for this National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education webinar. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm located on. I'm currently in Darwell Nation, and I acknowledge with deep respect the traditional custodians of this land, the Wadi Wadi people. I pay my respects to elders past and present and emerging, and to the Aboriginal community that continue to care for country. I stand for a future that profoundly respects and acknowledges Aboriginal perspectives, culture, language and history, and a continued effort to fight for Aboriginal justice and rights, paving the way for a strong future. Thank you today for joining us. Uh, my name is Sarah O'Shea. I'm the Director of the National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education, NESHI for short. NESHI is housed at Curtin University in Western Australia, funded by the Commonwealth Government with a dedicated mission to improve the higher education outcomes, that is access, participation, retention, success, and completion rates for marginalized and disadvantaged people through a variety of strategies, including research, practice, and policy. We are really excited today to have an international panel to reflect upon a very important topic, which is strategies for supporting the social and emotional well-being of students of color and First Nations students. This very important topic will be discussed by Professor James Smith from Menzies School of Health Research, who will speak about promoting the social and emotional well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander higher education students. James will be joined by Dr. Beck Yuk from Kobardi Aboriginal Centre and Murdoch University, who will present on supporting First Nations University students during times of crisis. And also we have Professor Daphne Watkins from the University of Michigan, who will reflect upon physical distance and social connection, the practice and potential of the YB Men Project. We are so delighted to have all our experts, experts here today. And you can imagine this has taken quite a while in the planning, but particularly want to thank Daphne, who is joining us a lot later in the evening US time. So I think it's 10 p.m. there. So thank you, Daphne. Um, before we start, just a few housekeeping details. And I might just ask James if he could share the uh, PowerPoint at this point. So this, this webinar is being live captioned by Bradley Reporting and will be recorded. The recording will be available on the NESHI website and uh, in the coming days. If you need closed captions, can you please click on the CC button in the toolbar that is located either at the top or the bottom of your screen? We also have captions available via browser and Nina will add that to the chat pod now. If you have any techno technological difficulties, please email ncsehe at curtain.edu.au. As we have three speakers today, we've planned for a panel discussion to run for the hour. And questions can be posed after the session today via the evaluation form, which will then be responded to after the session. At the end though, we will have 10 or so minutes where I'll invite the panelists to reflect on some of the issues that they've spoken about during the session. I'm going to ask now if you could perhaps start the session by going into the chat pod and just introducing yourself. It would be great if you could make sure that you introduce yourself to all panelists and participants uh, so that we get a sense of who, who else is out there in the ether. I know we have registrants from all over the country, and so it's really nice to meet each other and to comment in that chat pod. But please do choose all panelists and attendees when you post. Okay, that's it for me. I'm going to cross over to James now, who's going to start the presentation. Okay, thanks very much, um, Sarah. And I'm just trying to scroll through at the moment and it's not letting me move forward in the presentation. So I'm not quite sure where that's happening. There we go. Looks like we've got some movement now. Um, so thank you very much, Sarah, for that uh, warm introduction. And I would like to thank everybody, um, 200 plus participants, it looks like we've got online at the moment. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview view, um, at a relatively high level today around promoting the social emotional well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. 
and towards the new normal. So we'll have a bit of a focus on the, the COVID side of things, but I know that Beth will speak a little bit more about that in her presentation. And I know that Daphne will be talking around um, a particular intervention, YBMN project um, that she's led uh, for a number of years over in the US as well. Um, before I do go on uh, any further, um, I would like to pay my respects uh, and acknowledge the Larrakia people and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'm on Larrakia land at the moment. I've recently returned from the US and uh, I'm very glad and humbled to be able to work and live um, on this land in the Northern Territory. Uh, I also would like to thank the National Centre for inviting us to present today. I hope that um, that this is a really fruitful discussion and starts conversations and uh, but between particularly equity practitioners based here in Australia, but also elsewhere in the world. Uh, I'd also like to thank um, Bep and for Daphne for joining a, joining um, this discussion today. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Bep on a, an Aneshi project um, that we're doing at the moment around Indigenous males and higher education. And likewise, have just spent some time in the US with Daphne as well. So um, two brilliant people to, to be hearing from. In terms of what I'll be talking about, um, very briefly, what do we know about the social emotional wellbeing of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Again, at a very high level, I'm not going to go into detail, but there is lots of public health scholarship in this space within, within Australia. And I'm happy to provide some more details for people um, that, that would like those post uh, the presentation. But importantly, what can we do to address the social emotional wellbeing needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students in higher education? Um, it's a space that we know is really important, but it's a space that we don't have lots of clarity on what that looks like. But we'll give a few hints today around what strategies can be adopted in this space. So, so to set the scene uh, a little bit, I just wanted to, to go back to the public health scholarship that I mentioned. And there has been a lot of Aboriginal scholars that have done work in this space um, over many, many years. So certainly the last two decades, we've seen a real influx in um, scholarship in this space. Um, I've got two examples there of some work that's been done recently. One is some work that was done through the Closing the Gap Clearing House. Um, and another example there is some that Roxanne Bainbridge and colleagues has done around improving social and emotional wellbeing of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, which was um, a piece of work commissioned through Beyond Blue. Um, what I wanted to, to focus on are these nine guiding principles. And I really want people to, to put these in the back of their minds when they're thinking around what some of the approaches might be. These nine guiding principles, whilst they're part of the national strategic framework, um, have been principles that have been built up over many, many, de uh, many, many years. Um, and particularly service delivery contexts, um, have used this as a focus in the way that they approach um, social emotional wellbeing programs. So the Aboriginal community controlled health sector has provided um, or has played a really major role uh, in this regard. So it includes things like thinking of health holistically. So not just in a narrow um, biomedical or Western framework, but in, in a broader sense, rights to self-determination, um, need for cultural understanding, um, so that notion of cultural competency and cultural safety, of which we're seeing more and more about within the higher education space as well. Certainly, Natsi Heck have been driving on the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Higher Education Consortium. Natsi Heck have been doing lots of work in this space, um, as has Universities Australia. Um, and the impact of history, uh, the impact of history and trauma and loss. So that notion of trauma and loss and the need for healing around this and the read need for decolonizing approaches within this space. Recognition of human rights, um, really, you know, fundamental and is obviously key to the work that Nesh is involved with as well. Um, start addressing the impact of racism and stigma. And we've obviously seen lots in recent times with the Black Lives Matter movement um, that, that we've seen um, really come to the fore in the US, but that has certainly had a significant impact in Australia in recent times. Um, recognition of centrality of kinship, so those relationships, those family ties within an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander context. Uh, recognition of cultural diversity and recognition of Aboriginal strengths. And I think it's really important when we're talking about social emotional wellbeing to 
think from a strengths-based perspective. The Le Witcher Institute has done quite a bit of work around the importance of strengths-based narratives in the work uh, in this space. So what do we know about social emotional well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students? Well, we know that connection to family, culture and country are, are critical. They're so, so important. So these notions of ties to, to land and country, um, really important, particularly for rural and remote students, but indeed all students. Um, and there have been some, um, there has been some scholarship written in this space, but we're seeing more and more emerge and we're seeing this come up time and time again thematically in Indigenous focused research around higher education students. Um, we know that many of those um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students have actually already developed personal strategies relating to resilience and self-efficacy. That's not necessarily why they're at higher education. These are skills that they've developed across their life course. So across that education trajectory from primary school right through to higher education. Um, and, and it's important that when we're thinking about programs and services for those students and support structures, um, that we recognise those strengths that they bring. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but that notion of social emotional well-being is broader than Western concepts of mental, medical health. It's very easy for us to talk about mental health within a, a very biomedical paradigm. And we've got to shift away from that and to think of the broader social, cultural, political aspects um, of, of life. Uh, and, and recognising again from that holistic point of view that everything's connected as well. Um, in terms of university settings, we know that they can be harmful to the social emotional wellbeing of students and that goes back to some of those issues in the previous slide, are particularly around racism and stigma. Um, and therefore it's important that staff um, are appropriately trained to be able to engage students in a culturally competent manner but also to make sure that universities are, um, have environments that are suitable. And that's both online and offline environments. And I know that Beth will pick up on that in her presentation as well. Uh, what else does it tell us? Social emotional wellbeing impacts Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participation, achievement and completion um, within university context. That's kind of a no brainer. We, we know that our, our state of mind, that broader social emotional wellbeing has impacts in various aspects of our life. But we also know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students are often first in family uh, to attend university. And Sarah, the director of NESHI, has done um, some amazing research in, in that space. We also know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students and staff face structural and systemic racism on a daily basis. So whilst I mentioned it before, this is something that's, that is systemic. It's something that we see time and time again, and we need to have strategies to, to stop that. And, we're only really now starting to see some, some people speak out and say, actually, what's going on is not OK. We need to have better examples of providing strong, supportive environments in universities. And indeed, many of the people online today, I suspect, are doing work in that space at the moment. Um, and that goes on to the, the next bit around the culturally responsive environments. And, when we talk about environments, it's not just that social environment, it is the academic environment, it's the classroom, and like I said, online and offline environments there as well. Um, but it is that, that broader environment as well. Do people feel safe and comfortable within that broader university setting? What is being done to make them feel, feel better? Um, what else do we know? Um, family support is critical to, the, to Indigenous student success. So there's been some, some various reports through Neshi, and I'll touch on those in a moment as well. Um, but recognising that there's that broader um, community-oriented notion of um, health and well-being within an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander context is really important. Um, supporting digital literacy development is also really important. And if COVID um, hasn't shown us anything else, it's certainly shown us that we're, we're now shifting towards uh, an online environment and have had to do so quite quite quickly. Uh, again, I know Beth will touch on this in her presentation, but and, and as will Daphne, Daphne, I suspect as well. Um, but what we need to recognise here is that we need to support that digital literacy development. We need to think about whether people have the infrastructure to be able to engage, what that looks like, how that impacts them at a, at a personal level. Um, we also need to make sure that we've got ways to build that digital literacy in place so that they can engage in those spaces if they don't have the confidence to do so. 
uh, and that's both students and staff um, in, in that regard as well. Um, and I've already mentioned around the that students have that strong sense of self-efficacy and often develop resilient strategies across their life course. And I, again, I think that's a real, really important thing to recognise within the context of program development. I've included here a few projects um, that have been funded through NESHI in recent times. So um, don't just think of NESHI as um, the webinar extraordinaire, although it is, and today's a good example of that, but recognise that they've got so many resources on their website for you to be able to access. Go and have a look at some of these reports because the these small research grants that NESHI have provided have actually produced some amazing research findings in the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander space and indeed other equity spaces as well. Um, so I guess what can be done from a health perspective? Well, we need to recognise that past trauma impacts social emotional wellbeing, and it does so in a few different ways, some of which I've got listed there. Um, we know that colonisation um, has intergenerational impacts. There's very strong evidence from a public health perspective showing that now. We know that trauma-informed care or trauma-informed support is critical. So we're starting to see much more training happening in relation to trauma-informed practices, even trauma-informed research practices as well. So I know my team here at Menzies um, have all been engaged in trauma-informed training with an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, organisation locally, a peak body. Um, we also need to talk about healing programs as being legitimate within this space as well. What we find um, is that people um, will often consider healing programs to be something a bit um, light and fluffy, and that's anything but the truth. What we're finding is that healing programs provide a really um, deep sense of connectivity between people that have experienced trauma, and we've got to recognise that. So some of those group-based models are really important within that healing space. We need to recognise that people of colour face multiple health and social inequities that prevent access to and participation in higher education. And two points that I wanted to, to make there were that inequities are often felt across the life course. So if we look at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, um, we know that they've already gone through an education system that nece hasn't necessarily supported their needs as best as it could, whether that be in the early years, primary school, secondary school, or indeed, um, post-secondary education, and particularly in the vet space. So recognising that they've faced those inequities all through that journey and that they've got to a quite a pointy end when it comes to the education system when they get to higher education. And we really need to start acknowledging those inequities that they've faced. And I say both health and social inequities there because it's not just the, uh, the health inequities related to their social emotional wellbeing, it's those broader inequities, social inequities that they face, whether that be in relation to their education, the education system, the justice system, et cetera. And again, we've heard lots in the Black Lives Matter movement about that in recent times. The other thing I wanted to say though, is that these are often cumulative impacts as well. So if you are an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person that's from a low socioeconomic background or from a rural and regional background, there are those compounding factors relating to those inequities that you face. Um, so that ability to, to show resilience, to have self-efficacy in those contexts is really important. The image that I've got up there is a promising practice guide that the team here that I lead at Menzies um, completed just recently. It was re released earlier this year and it's around improving the social emotional wellbeing of young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, whilst it's focused on severe and complex mental health needs, the strategies in there are important and those strategies are set up for both service provide or service providers, uh, commissioners and policy makers. So I've, I've left the link in the presentation which will be available post-seminar. Um, some other things that can be done. We need to call out forms of racism. We know that. I've spoken about that. We've heard about that from Black Lives Matter um, work um, and many other scholars you know, not just here in Australia, but globally. Um, and something that I think you'll hear through Daphne's presentation is that the interventions that we create need to be gender sensitive, culturally responsive and age appropriate. And they need to address that complexity. It's no use just saying, this is a particular, you know, these are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander males, or these are um, people from a certain background, or these are a cohort of 18 to 25. We need to actually understand the 
um, the complexities in the audiences that we're, we're engaging. I've included a few very recent papers from the American Journal of Men's Health, um, one that we've done on work based here in Australia and one that Daphne's done based on her work that she'll be presenting today. And I think engaging with this scholarship to inform strategy development and program development is really important. Here are a few other, um, a few other resources. I'm going to, um, I'm not going to go through those now in any detail because we're short on time and I want to make sure we get to the other presentation. So I'll hand it over to Beck now. Sorry, I've got to stop my share. Thank you, James. There we go, Beb. Okay. okay, I'll just bring up the slides. Great, so I'm Beb Ewing. I'm from the Kulbadi Aboriginal Centre at Murdoch University here in Perth. Um, I'm going to be talking today about supporting Indigenous students um, at university during times of crisis. And of course, the latest crisis we've had in terms of student wellbeing has been around COVID-19. Um, before I start formally, I want to acknowledge that I am coming to you today from Noongar country, and I want to pay respect to my ancestors on this land and understand that they have an enduring and dynamic culture and pay respect to my Noongar elders, both past and present. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, any First Nations people in attendance today. So my aim of this presentation is to really share some, what I think is best practice from Coolbardi Aboriginal Centre around what we did to support our student body during COVID-19. Um, and I see a lot from the chat that there's a lot of practitioners who would be having face-to-face -face contact with their Indigenous student cohorts. So that's really great. Um, but when we talk about COVID-19, like James touched on, what we're really talking about is a transition to online learning. And how do we support Aboriginal students um, when we don't necessarily have that face-to-face -face contact? So to start with, I'll give some current um, enrolment and progression figures for Aboriginal university students, and then do a very brief overview of the historical and current context of our students to provide context for those figures. I'll briefly go through the impacts we saw of, um, of COVID-19 on our students' wellbeing and what we did as a centre to respond and how we're taking those lessons into our future practice. So as you can see, this is a figure taken from the Department of Education and Training who release um, figures around higher education. Um, the purple line there that I've circled is Indigenous student enrolments in bachelor degrees. Um, and as you can see, they're slowly increasing. We're, we're slowly increasing the rates of students at university. Um, especially from 2013 onwards, that's a bit more of an increase. Um, but what we can also see from the figure is that the, compared to other equity groups, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students' aren't, enrolments aren't increasing as fast. So, for example, that yellow line is students with a disability, and that's really shot up in terms of enrolments. And then this figure, second figure shows us Indigenous bachelor completion rates across six years. So how many students, what percentage of Aboriginal students who've enrolled in a bachelor degree have completed that degree within six years? And as you can see, that figure is holding steady at around 40% across the years. Um, so this is alarming. This is telling us that under 50% of Aboriginal students who enroll in a bachelor degree have got that degree by six years. And if we think about an increase in enrolments, but not necessarily an increase in completions, there's a question as to what's happening to Aboriginal students when they enter our universities and are they necessarily completing? Uh, but there are a few reasons for why, why that figure is so low in terms of completions. One of them might be the way in which we actually measure completions. So the centre have done some great work supporting analysis of regional and remote Indigenous students and what their completion rates are. And they actually found in this report that uh, Aboriginal students take at least 10 years to complete their degrees, not six. So it might be that the national data and how it's captured isn't really taking into account how long it actually takes for an Aboriginal student to complete a degree. Um, the figures could also be around greater counselling around being at university given to students. So it could be the case that students are coming in 
trying university out and realising it's not for them and having some greater resources around other university options. Um, as James talked about, there's definitely university level figures, uh, level factors that um, indicate whether someone would want to stay at university or not. And in terms of our topic today, definitely student wellbeing we know plays into how well students can study and when mental health and mental health conditions come in, that obviously affects people's capacity to study. So the history of Aboriginal Australians in higher education is, is long and complex. Um, I wanted to give a brief overview really so people who weren't familiar with the setting could understand the figures and why um, our completion rates are lower than non-Aboriginal students, but also to show that Aboriginal people have had a really resilient story when it comes to engaging Western systems. Um, so in terms of where learning began, Prior to colonisation, learning occurred for Aboriginal people mainly through observation and through sharing knowledge in the forms of storytelling. And so we have a rich history of sharing knowledge in our culture. With colonisation, um, there was this move towards what Martin Nakata had referred to in his book as educating the savages. So this idea that Aboriginal people needed to be westernised um, and that they needed to be taught, taught mainly Christian ways. Um, so obviously a very negative view of education there. Moving forward up until 1937 in Australia, we had government policy, which was the Aboriginal Australians Protection Act. Um, and this saw the first time when Aboriginal children were allowed to engage in Western schooling. Uh, but the purpose of this was to teach them how to become domestic servants or labourers. Um, and as you can see from the slide, children weren't allowed to complete high school, so they were sent out to work at 12 years of age. So not really entering the education system. Um, if we move forward to 1937, the government policy changed to that of assimilation, and we saw a big increase in Aboriginal children being allowed to participate in Western schooling systems at all levels. But this was very much around teaching Aboriginal children to think white, act white, and there was not a lot of representation of Aboriginal culture and Aboriginal knowledges in what was taught. And so this led to a very big sense of erasure and real erasure of Aboriginal identity and a separation of Aboriginal knowledges from the Western education system that we're still dealing with today. Uh, fast forward to the 1970s and the government implemented what we now has, have as the primary policy, which is self-determination. And this was finally the recognition that we as Aboriginal people have the right to self-determination and as part of that, we should be involved in decision making around educating our children and our young people. And so these are the policies now that, that frame kind of discussions around Aboriginal higher education and have launched, I suppose, the policies we have now around indigenising curriculum. So what is, what is it like being an Aboriginal student in higher education? We at Kulbadi, we, we kind of talked to students a lot about this cultural interface, which was provo um, proposed by Martin Nakata. So he describes the cultural interface as a contested space um, where students are put between two knowledge systems, both Western and Indigenous, um, and things are not clearly black or white. Um, so it's a very ambiguous space. Um, indigenous, indigenous students at the space often feel a contradiction and a tension. Um, of feeling like they have to align with one, one knowledge or another, or one way of learning or another, so either Indigenous or Western. And that can be quite conflicting. Um, and what we find is that our students, when they enter university, can, can really struggle with that tension. Um, and some colleagues of mine who did a study here at the centre found that students entering university initially felt that doing so was, in a sense, betraying their sense of Aboriginality and this is what they were hearing from their families and their community. But as they went through, they were able to have this transformative experience that we know that university brings and it actually helps students develop even a greater sense and connection with the Aboriginality to be at this cultural interface. So it's, it's, a, it's a tense and complicated space for students to be in. And then we had um, COVID-19. Um, so from this, we saw social distancing guidelines that were put in across Australia and it meant the closure essentially of university campuses across Australia and a rapid migration to online learning. So within my own institution, 
we were given staff and students were given two weeks to prepare for online learning to transition all of their unit content online. Um, and from discussions I've had with colleagues, that, that actually was quite a lot of time, I suppose, compared to what other people were given. Um, but what we found, what colleagues and I found was that equity groups, particularly Aboriginal students, were being overlooked in decisions around this transition online and around planning discussions. Although we did have evidence that the universities were concerned that students generally would struggle with online teaching and learning. So we saw this evidence by our university's academic safety net, which was um, a policy put in place that any, any student who had a fail for the semester where it was online learning didn't have that recorded on their transcript. So there was definitely messaging from the university that students, would, students across the board would struggle with online learning. And so thinking about this and, and putting together a response about what social distancing guidelines and closure of universities might mean for Aboriginal students, um, we were thinking, okay, this is already, already an educationally disadvantaged group of young people and students. And we theorised that actually the social distancing that came about through COVID could put our students at risk of three forms of isolation. So we, we thought of the cultural isolation that could endure the digital isolation and then combined these forms of isolation would lead to even further educational disadvantage and isolation. In terms of cultural isolation, here we have on the screen an Indigenous model of social emotional well-being, um, which really grasps at some of the um, points and determinants that James was talking about earlier. But as you can see, four of the seven components of well-being there are about having connection with country or connection with other people. And so what we saw with social distancing guidelines was that ability to connect with others and country was really restricted for our students. So for students who wanted to return to country who weren't necessarily um, on country because they were down here learning, that became impossible because of interstate um, travel border closures. Um, what we saw was the mass postponement and, and all cancel of events that happened in the community. So the biggest one was that NAIDOC week was postponed. Um, and so what we'd normally be having a NAIDOC week celebration where people could come together and really get that sense of community and culture, that was, people were unsure whether that was going to go ahead. And then on, on a more individual level, students were unable to connect with family as much as that they would because people were staying away from each other. So particularly students with elderly family, they were telling them not to visit because they were concerned about their well-being. So this social distancing really impaired our students' ability to have that connection. And that had both practical and psychological impacts that we could see. So primarily um, for our female students, not being able to call on family to help with childcare was a huge burden. And that added an additional stress on top of the stresses that come with the typical university studies. And then not having that easy access of just being to drop into a friend's house or a family member's house meant that students weren't necessarily getting that debrief and that social support that they normally get. For our students in particular, we have, we have about 300 Aboriginal students across the campus and about a third of them kind of regularly visit the centre and have a really big community practice at the centre. So we were really worried that that social support and that emotional support would be lost um, with the centre not being um, as accessible. So our second form of isolation we thought about was digital isolation. And we know that as James um, kind of touched on that Aboriginal Australians are part of the digital divide. So they have lower access to digital technology. And so when we transition to online learning, it's an, it's an obvious question is, how will that disadvantage our students? So we saw issues around device ownership. Um, so even if students did have a laptop or a tablet, they were often using that device to give to their children for homeschooling. And so they would either have to use it really late at night or, or not use it at all and they couldn't do their studies. And of course we had students um, who were struggling to get a stable internet connection. But access also extends beyond those kind of pragmatic things. And it really goes into, do students even know how to engage with an online learning system? 
So even if a student has a device and an internet connection, are they really comfortable um, with using an online learning system? And we also saw a lot of low motivation. So not having that accountability of coming to class um, in a regular routine really impacted our students. And we were also worried about the non-Indigenised online curriculum. So when I talk about indigenizing the curriculum, that's about bringing Indigenous worldviews and perspectives into the curriculum. And it's being proposed as a way to ensure that Aboriginal knowledges are respected and given equal precedence as Western knowledges in our universities. Various universities have been working towards indigenizing their curriculums uh, across Australia, and there's many different ways in which that can be achieved. But uh, another kind of centre-based report by Dreams and colleagues found that this isn't happening at all in learning management systems. So Dreams and colleagues looked at 10 universities across Australia and their online learning management systems, and they assessed them against what they proposed as um, fairly solid principles for engaging Aboriginal students in online learning. So whether the, the platform allowed them to communicate with each other, to collaborate, whether there was a learning community and whether there was interculturality built into the curriculum. And they concluded that essentially at, at present, and that was a couple of years ago, that learning management systems were not designed with Indigenous education in mind. So we had a real fear that students weren't necessarily getting an appropriate curriculum when they were going online. So this cultural social isolation, but as well as digital isolation, we theorise would really converge to edu educationally isolate our students in two ways. So as I said before, that loss of a support community, so not being able to access community members and family members, but also not being able to access your peers at the centre here at Kulbadi. We were really worried that that would impact wellbeing. And then a loss of a learning community. So we very much think of Kulbadi and the broader university as a learning community where students um, can debate issues with each other, talk with each other, and that allows the co-construction of knowledge, which we know is a really essential part of learning. So what did, what did we do to support our students? So along with the rest of the university, um, we at the centre were given two weeks to transition to complete online learning and support. So we, we do teaching at the centre, we, we teach an enabling course, but we also are responsible for all the student support for Indigenous students across the university. And so our primary concern was how are we going to maintain contact and relationships with students and so they feel engaged and they feel like they're still part of a learning community. And so we had, we had a staff discussion and decided that, okay, so what we will, will do, we'll extend our transition academic pastoral support or our TAPS model um, and make that more frequent. So typically our TAPS model involves regular check-ins with students at what we know to be pressure points across the semester. So we have student support coordinators who reach out um, by email or phone and check in with the student at week one, week five and week 10, just to check how they're going. And we ask questions around the transition. So this previous semester, we were asking, how are you feeling about the transition to online learning? And, and what can we do to support that? Whether they've um, set up academically, so whether they'd booked kind of collaborate meetings with their tutors, or if there were any assignments they were worried about. Um, we offer pastoral support by reaching out and asking how they're feeling about COVID, how they were feeling about online learning, and then we offer a broad, how, what can we do to support you? How can we point you in the right way, in the right direction? And so we increase that frequency to weekly. All the staff got involved, not just our student support coordinators. Um, we divided up students by discipline group and everybody had a student list to either email weekly, to phone call or use social media to check in with them. And that was based on the student preferences. Um, and. And based on some work that Sean Bennett, a PhD student at the centre, had been doing, we also decided to do daily text messages to what we know to be at-risk students, because we know that helps keeps them engaged. Um, so they were daily check-ins around how they were feeling. So through that process, we reached out to all of our 235 Aboriginal students who are enrolled at the university, 
and we actually ended up having contact with 178 of those students. So 76% of our cohort we managed to reach by the end of semester and check in with. And for the majority of those students, we had multiple contacts across the semester. So I pulled some comments that staff were making on a, on a spreadsheet we had developed around what were some of the common issues um, to do with COVID. And of course, we had issues with online learning. You can see some quotes there. The students couldn't get in to collaborate. Um, they were feeling like they wanted to socialise more. And then a lack of motivation as well. So feeling stress, not sleeping, um, but the email check-ins were keeping other students on track. Uh, we also, to overcome that kind of social or cultural isolation, we hosted regular what we called cup of tea sessions over Microsoft Teams. So instead of having a cup of tea at the kitchen, as we normally would with students, um, we did those online. And the university also had online regular activities hosted through their Facebook page. Um, we also provided students with data credit um, so they could top up their phones and hotspot them. We allowed them to borrow some laptops we had at the centre, um, pull forward our usual laptop subsidy, and even though we're not really experts, provided some IT support to some students, um, reminded unit coordinators that our students didn't have necessarily digital literacy and they needed to understand that with assignments. And then the broader university as well also put together um, a really great support package around technology bursaries and IT equipment. We also shared specific resources with students through our Facebook page or through check-ins. So anything we found online from the Australian Psychological Society or um, Aboriginal health websites that James was sharing, um, we sent through to students as well as app suggestions to increase your productivity. And we also worked with the Health and Counselling Centre to make a family and domestic violence resource because we were con um, particularly concerned about students who might be in unsafe environments. I'll come back to this slide on resources, but I suppose I wanted to end on this idea that university Indigenous student wellbeing, although it's something that we face every, we deal with every day as the Aboriginal Centre, the actual Universities Australia policy now is that of a whole of university approach. And so that really means that all university staff have a really important role to play in supporting Indigenous student wellbeing and their progressions and their completions. So lessons we've learned and that we're going to take forward, we've always known that relationships are key when working with Aboriginal students. Um, but we know now if you do enough outreach and that outreach is frequent and across multiple digital mediums, that that, can, that communication and relationship building can happen online. Um, we shouldn't, as James said, assume digital competency. Um, we should understand that indigenizing curriculum needs to happen offline as well as online. And we need to acknowledge as educators the impact that broader social events have on student wellbeing. Um, I'll click us back quickly to the resources that we shared with students that you can find at Health Infonet. So I actually made these in conjunction with another project I'm part of, but it was about just pulling together some simple self-care tips around staying strong in language that our students would understand and appreciate, um, just to support them along the way. So I'll stop sharing now. And I will pass on to Daphne. Thank you. Okay, so let me now share my screen. And uh, in the event that we run out of time, I want to encourage everyone to submit some questions through the evaluation form and we will endeavor to answer those uh, post the both post the webinar today. So I've been encouraged to share that information with you. So again, I am Daphne Watkins. I am a professor at the University of Michigan here in the United States. And I want to begin by acknowledging the land that I'm on. So we acknowledge that the University of Michigan, named for Michigami, is the, uh, the world's largest freshwater system and located in the Huron River watershed. It was formed and has grown through connections with the land stewarded by Niswi, Ishkodewan, Anishinaabeg, the three fires people who are the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Putawatome. 
And these, along with their neighbors, the Seneca, Delaware, Shawnee, and Wyandotte nations. So I want to make sure that I acknowledge the land that I'm on. So I'm really excited to talk with everyone today about an exciting project that I developed some years ago and is currently um, running. It's called the YB Men Project. And the YB Men is an acronym for Young Black Men, Masculinities and Mental Health Project. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in the next few slides. So let me begin with what I would call are some sobering statistics. And I promise you I'm going to start here, but this is not where I'm going to end. And I also want to note that these are some statistics that uh, are really speaking to the current livelihood of Black men in the United States. And also just as a reference, when I use the term Black men, I'm speaking specifically about African American men and also men who um, are of African descent in the United States. So just to provide that context, I think is helpful for this particular presentation. So what we're finding now is that many of the statistics that we're seeing in the United States around Black men show that Black men live about seven years less than other men uh, in other racial groups, that they have higher death rates compared to women for all leading causes of death, that Black men ages uh, 18 to 44 are less likely to report feelings of anxiety or depression, that they're less likely to also seek help for their mental health challenges, that they're five times more likely to die from HIV, AIDS, and that also suicide is the third leading cause of death for Black males ages 15 to 24. So I just want to give you a sense for what a lot of the research right now is telling us based on Black men in the United States. So let me tell you a little bit about my work. So I'm approaching my second decade now studying the mental health of Black men here in the United States. And so these are just some screenshots from some of my uh, publications that I have been able to put out into the scientific community over the past few years. And so what I would say is I would summarize my work is really trying to understand and do something to improve uh, Black men's mental health, uh, try to do more to encourage more progressive definitions of manhood or masculinities in the plural sense, but also thinking about how can we increase social support for men, because a lot of the literature that we're producing here is showing that uh, not just Black men, but, but many men don't feel safe or comfortable disclosing vulnerability and really sharing some of the challenges that they're, they're going through. And so they tend to keep those things bottled up. And so I'm really trying to, with this kind of work, unpack what are those nuances and what are the social determinants that influence uh, Black men, specifically within groups of Black men, because as we know, they're not a monolithic group. So we're trying to get a deeper understanding about the different features and characteristics of Black men in the United States. So this is a diagram from a paper that I published in 2012. So speaking of social determinants of health, with this paper, which is a heavy conceptual paper, I was really trying to unpack what are these determinants and what kinds of things should we take into consideration as we understand things like depression and psychological distress over the adult life course for Black men. And so you'll see along the bottom of this triangle six determinants of mental health that I've been really able to uh, dig a little deeper into over the course of the past few years. Things like socioeconomic status, stressors, racial identity and masculine identity, kinship and social support, also self-esteem and mastery, and then quality health care. But you'll see that this triangle is angled up. And so a lot of my work clusters in different areas here, but the majority of it is really around this young adult Black male group, which we define as ages 18 to 30. That middle adult group is usually 31 to 54, and the older adult group is 55 and older. Okay, so I present this just to sort of lay a foundation for uh, the, the, the YB Men program that I'm about to share. But speaking of YB Men, so I, I talk a little bit about social determinants of, of mental health here, but what I was beginning to do a little later in my work was, you know, really try to understand, given the fact that we know that uh, many men, and particularly Black men, are, are very... Um, less likely, I would say, to go and seek help for their mental health challenges and just really being affected by the stigma that is put on 
this idea of being vulnerable or being perceived as weak, I wanted to do a little bit of digging into understanding, well, what does internet use look like for Black men? What kinds of things can we expect? Should we uh, decide to produce some sort of internet related program or intervention for Black men? And so I just have here on this screen a few screenshots from some publications that sort of help ground my work with this idea of thinking about what does internet use and social media and uh, different kinds of online programming look like for Black men. And so this really sparked an interest for me. And it really began to encourage me to think, you know, if this is something that I'm really passionate about, that I have to really think about what's most relevant particularly for that young adult age group, so that 18 to 30 year old age group. And so I began to dig deeply into social media and, and what kinds of platforms are, are primarily used with that particular demographic. And then I began to ask myself, so what would happen if we used social media as a tool to improve mental health, promote positive, more progressive definitions of manhood, and increase social support for Black men. And from that primary question, the YB Men Project was born. So you'll see here that again, YB Men is an acronym for the Young Black Men, Masculinities, and Mental Health Project. But as you can imagine, that's a mouthful. So we just call this the YB Men Project for short. So now I'm going to tell you some of the details around how we recruit for the YB Men Project. So I want to be very clear that what the YBMN Project aims to achieve is not to provide any kind of therapy or any kind of therapeutic experience for our participants. Instead, we target Black men who are in that 18 to 30 year old age range who may be less likely to discuss sensitive topics face to face, they may also be the kind of guys whose distress has not yet reached clinical severity. So they have not been diagnosed for a mental health disorder or an anxiety disorder by any clinician. And then we want guys who also want to have these conversations about mental health, manhood, and social support in a private social media based setting. So it's very important to not only identify guys who may less likely, you know, talk about these things face to face, who have not been diagnosed, but also who are open to having these conversations with other men in a private social media group. So I want to just walk you through what does the process look like for all of our participants. So this, to the left of your screen or to the left side of your screen, you'll see just a little pathway that all of our participants follow, or at least those so far, right? We've done about five or six iterations of the YB Men Project across various college campuses in the Midwestern part of the United States. So um, in and around the state of Michigan, which is where I live and where the University of Michigan is, and I'll show you a map at the end of this presentation with the actual stars where you can see uh, where we've done the work so far. But on the left side of the screen, you'll see that we usually begin every YB Men project with some sort of baseline interview. So we have done these interviews via social or, or via um, the internet. So we've used things like Skype and Google Hangouts for the guys that who. Um, who have been sort of further out and not sort of in our drivable distance. We then have all the participants take a baseline survey. After they complete the interview and the survey, they receive a small cash incentive just as a thank you. But then during that survey, we encourage guys to either opt in to the YB Men Project or to opt out. For those who opt in, we immediately enroll them in the project and we assign them to a YB Men social media group. And to date, we've used Facebook for the majority of our YB Men Project interventions. We've also pilot tested Instagram for some of our programming. Now at the conclusion of the YB Men Project, I'm actually at number five here on the screen, they complete a second round of interviews and surveys, and then they receive another small cash incentive just as a thank you. So now in the next few slides, what I'd like to do is just present some outcome data from our latest iteration of the YB Men Project, which occurred at two large universities right here in the, Midwest, the Midwestern part of the United States. 
Uh, and I'd like to show you exactly what that looks like and what we found from the black men that we worked with at these two schools. So we began with that survey that we had as many guys complete as we could possibly get. We had about 350 black college men across the two campuses complete the survey. We had then about 50 guys opt in to the YB Men Project Intervention. And from that, about 40 were selected or completed all of the paperwork that allowed them to be eligible to participate in the YB Men Intervention. And so it was really exciting to be able to have these gentlemen self-select into the YB Men Intervention. So, you know, again, we just began by issuing a survey and the survey covered our three primary outcomes, mental health, manhood or masculinity and social support. And so I'll talk a little bit about what we found in just a second. But at the end of the survey, we encouraged guys to think about participating in this private social media based a group with other black men where they could build community and receive some mental health education. And so we had about 40 guys who ended up being in the final program. So what I want to show you now is just a sample Facebook curriculum. So I'm going to walk you through what's here. But the number one question that we receive from people who are interested in the YB Men Project is exactly what happens in that private Facebook group. And so what I've put together here is essentially a curriculum or a sample curriculum for what that intervention can look like. So we have this broken down by week. And just so you know, we never really finalize any curriculum without partnering with the university. So even though our interventions are based at these college campuses in various cities around our region, we make sure that we sit down with the counseling center directors there and the multicultural center directors and also students from the campus. And we negotiate what topics do we want to cover? What are some very relevant concerns and challenges that the black men on your campus are facing? And we actually lay those out. And then my team comes back to our campus and we spend weeks brainstorming about relevant content. Now, for those of you who are really into popular culture, you may notice and recognize some familiar faces on the screen now. And this is why uh, I think we're having a lot of success with the YB Men Project is because a cornerstone of the YB Men Project is the use of popular culture references. So you'll see here that each week has a theme. We begin with an introduction to the project and an orientation to the project. We then cover racial identity, masculine identity, mental health, well-being, and social support. And then we wrap up and close. But with every week, we post questions. We use things like YouTube videos and song lyrics. Essentially, we use content that many of our participants are already engaged with on a day-to-day -day kind of level. And so we post content and we have, I guess, conversations, uh, if you will, about what kinds of thing in popular culture are influencing how these men see themselves, how they um, really grapple with their mental health or challenges or stress or pressures that they're facing as young black men in the United States. It's really interesting to hear them and actually to read in some of the Facebook group posts how they think more about their identity given what's happening in popular culture, be it in music or art, or even movies, but also in the news. You know, there are lots of racial tensions happening right now in different parts of the United States. And what we have found over the years is that when an, a YB men group is active, these black college men run to this group and it's really a safe place for them to process what's happening in the world around them. So even though we present initial content and ideas that we want to uh, engage um, and with the men, they usually bring their own content as well, which is really um, an important piece of building this kind of community in a, a social media setting. And so I'm just going to flip through a few screens here so you can see some actual, you know, real content that has been exchanged via our intervention. So 
for a while, the, the football player Colin Kaepernick was very popular, uh, not necessarily for his football um, abilities, but for taking a knee during our national anthem. And so a lot of the Black men from our program would come to our group and process what's happening with the NFL, the National Football League here in the United States. And, you know, they would want to come and, and talk about what does that mean? What does that symbolize to have a Black male football player kneel during the National Anthem? And so we were able to capture their reactions right here in the YB Men Facebook group. You know, we also, as I mentioned, post a lot of popular culture videos and song lyrics, and it was a great opportunity for men to really grapple with some of the things that they were taught as children or things that they were taught by their fathers or their uncles or their, even their older siblings. And so they really found some benefit to be able to uh, question some of the ways that they were raised and really decide for themselves if they wanted to take those kinds of ideals into their um, adulthood. And then, you know, because we, we work with a lot of Black college men who, for many of them, are first-generation college students, you know, many of them don't have families or don't come from families or have parents who completed college degrees, this was a whole new world for them to be the first in their families to enter college, to be among other Black men, you know, and to be around what they would consider maybe a positive environment, but they really felt like fish out of water. And so we were able to really tackle some of those challenging discussions and questions that they had about what does it mean to be uh, a Black college man in this world today. So the next few slides are just some results that I'm going to quickly go through because I know we're running short on time, but our three primary outcomes are mental health, so in our case, depressive symptoms that we capture using the PHQ-9 and also the Gotland Male Depression Scale. So you'll see here from this slide that uh, we saw depressive symptoms decrease over the course of the intervention. So you'll see that before the YB men intervention, we saw depressive symptoms be around uh, maybe 7.55 for the PHQ-9 and around 10 for the Gotland Male Depression Scale. But you'll see after those scores dropped uh, tremendously, the means did anyway. And for um, this change, it was statistically significant. Our second primary outcome is what we call traditional masculine norms or masculinities with plural sense. And there are different subscales within our measure for masculine norms. And for the YB Men Project, we use a shorter version of the conformity to masculine norms inventory. And so I won't spend much time here, but you'll see just variations as the blue bars are these men's scores before the YB Men intervention and the orange are afterwards. So you'll see that um, the scores have changed. We actually want these scores to go down. And so we saw a little bit of variation across the different uh, participants for this particular uh, measure. And then finally, the last primary outcome is really increasing social support. We want men to be participants in our group and we want them to see something beneficial with coming together with like-minded men and even those who are not like-minded and really trying to grapple with the world around them, um, receiving health education, receiving positive messages, but also being able to have difficult conversations about the things that they're dealing with as uh, for many first-generation uh, Black college students. And so I'll just begin to wrap up here, but I, I think sometimes the voices behind the numbers can be so powerful. And so I just want to share some of the intervention results and some quotes that came directly from this more recent, this latest iteration of the project. So with regard to the meaning of mental health and depression, one gentleman said, when I think of depression, I think of it across a spectrum. I think a lot of times when people talk about depression, we only talk about it in the most severe stage of it. We don't talk about the early phases of it and other forms of mental health challenges that can lead to depression. So I think they, they're they two very complex issues and words, and I honestly don't know if there is one real definition to define them. With regard to masculinities and how different they may be for, uh, for Black men and Black college men in particular, one gentleman said, from my, ex my personal experience, I think Black men's experience with masculinity is more severe than some other cultures. I feel like other cultures, especially white cultures, are more likely to talk about counseling and getting professional help or talking to a therapist with their children growing up versus in a Black community 
It's like, no, you deal with it. You go deal with it on your own. You don't let things that happen in your family get outside that family. And then when it comes to stress, you know, it was really interesting to be in these groups with these guys and to hear them talk about stress and the pressure that they have to deal with as a black man in the United States. One guy said, they call stress the silent killer that will build up and that eats away at you over time. Also, in a land where you're supposed to be able to do things such as protest freely in a peaceful manner, you have people saying you can't do this. Many see other people getting away with other types of activities and just not being condoned for it. And then finally, we always want to get a sense for, do these participants like the YB Men Project? Do they feel like it's relevant for Black college men? And so here are a couple of final quotes that came from some participants. One guy said, what you guys are doing, the actual program and trying to spread awareness about mental health to Black men, I think it's really good. And then another guy said, the YB Men Group was definitely a safe space where you could talk about your ideas as Black men, and talk about your opinions on things without judgment, without backlash. Because this was a private group, only we could see what we were saying. It just felt good. And it showed me what having a social support group would be like. And so with that, I'll begin to bring my portion of the presentation to a close. Just wanna give you a sense for those who may not be familiar with how the states are, are lined out here. This is a map of the state of Michigan, where I live and where the University of Michigan is. And so far we've been able to do the YB Men Project with about six college campuses in our region. We're also beginning to pilot test ideas for how can we maybe start a little younger having these conversations about mental health, masculinities, and social support. So we're currently piloting some ideas of doing a version of YB Men for high school students. And we've already done some exploratory work with some middle school students. And so the goal moving forward is really to, yes, start here in the state of Michigan and in our region, but really think about a train the trainers model that will allow us to bring these things full circle and do some great work all across the United States. So with that, I'll just share some final presentations, all of the, or some final publications, all of the data that I presented on um, during this talk actually came from this paper that James alluded to earlier. And here is my contact information and I look forward to uh, hearing from people as soon as we, I think we're wrapping up now. So maybe we'll have some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne, and thank you, everyone else, uh, James and Beth as well. Um, unfortunately, we have really run out of time um, and we've gone over a little bit, but I'm sure everyone will agree it was such a powerful presentation from each of our speakers. Each, each presentation was really an hour in its own right. And you managed to get through a lot of information in a very short period of time. So I suppose I'm going to sort of finish up now, but I did want to remind people that if they wanted to ask some questions, I know there are some questions on the Q&A which we'll collect, but also we'll be sending out an evaluation form and you're very welcome to include some questions there. And we'll talk to the panelists and ask them to supply answers. We often follow up these webinars with additional resources and information. Uh, our website has been slightly overwhelmed with people eager to download the slides. So just be aware that we will be sending them out directly to you via email within the next day or two. So uh, don't worry, all the resources that have been covered will be available there. And this last slide, just again, if you haven't connected with the National Centre, please do so. We're very welcome. Uh, we welcome everyone to get, get involved and also to get our newsletter, which comes out every four to six weeks. On that note, I'm going to thank our presenters again and thank Daphne for staying up so late and, and being such a terrific uh, presenter, but also James and Beth uh, for their involvement in the session today. And also for ADSET for their continuing support and assistance with these webinars. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>